In this sermon, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, in all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for the good news preached to this church. The living and active word of God that changes and transforms. Spirit of God, I pray that you'd use your word to give glory to Jesus Christ, that all would see and know his greatness. In Jesus' good name, amen. Sometimes people use the Bible for their own advantage, and they take the Bible out of context and use what they think they're getting out of the Bible for their own advantage, like this story. A preacher's car broke down on a country road, and he walked to the nearest place where he could get a phone, uh, and it was a bar. And he saw his old friend Frank in the bar, and Frank was not looking good. He wasn't feeling good, dressed very shabbily. The preacher asked him, Frank, what happened to you? You used to be rich. You used to have all this wealth, and look at you now. You're at the bottom of the barrel. Frank told him that he had unfortunately had some bad investments and this led to his downfall the preacher said go home open your bible at random and stick your finger on a page where your finger lands there will be the answer to all of your problems now sometime later the preacher bumped into frank he was wearing a gucci suit he was wearing a rolex watch he was looking great he just got out of his brand new mercedes And the preacher asked him, what is going on? You're doing, you just seem to be doing great. And Frank responded, yes, preacher, and I owe it all to you. I opened my Bible, put my finger down on the page, and there was the answer. Chapter 11. Of course, chapter 11, bankruptcy. All joking aside, this is how people treat the Bible. Frank was not in good shape at all. He looked at the Bible, got an idea from the Bible that is not in the Bible. And sometimes people take the Bible out of context and get what they want out of it instead of what God wants them to hear through the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. In this passage of 1 Peter chapter 1, 22-25, we see the great importance of the Word of God. Peter quotes actually from the book of Isaiah to remind us that the words of God that are found in the Bible are eternal. The promises of God will never fail. They're reliable, trustworthy, and eternal. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 16, Peter calls these, calls these Christians to be sober-minded, to focus on the hope that will be fully given to them to Jesus Christ and he calls them to be holy to the Lord because the Lord has been gracious with these Christians he's given of a new birth through a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ they're to be holy because Jesus Christ has saved these believers souls they are to be holy and because the Lord had given these Christians the Old Testament which testified to the greatness of Christ, they are to live holy lives. 1 Peter chapter 1, 16 says, They're to be holy because God is holy. Quoting Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 to 45. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 19, Peter calls these Christians to fear the Lord. The reason these Christians are to fear the Lord is, is because the Lord has ransomed them through the precious blood of Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, we talked about the five important truths of Jesus Christ 
and how he accomplishes this ransom and this redemption. The eternal God, Jesus, assumed human nature. He died on the cross, bearing the punishment of God for sin, and God raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus ascended back into heaven to reign and rule with the Father. And now we come to this next passage, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, which talks about purity and love. And we have three points. Verse 22, purified souls. Verse 23, powerful gospel. In verse 24 to 25, the power of the word of God. Let's look at these purified souls. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. This phrase, having purified your souls, speaks to the wonderful work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. First, this verb purified, it's put in the perfect in the Greek, which means that the purification of their souls is a completed action that cannot be done. God, through Jesus Christ, made their souls pure and they cannot be made unholy or impure. This also explains to us the great work of Jesus on the cross. He purifies their souls, Christian souls, once for all. But second, the verb purified is passive, which means that God is the one who has purified them through Jesus Christ. The word purified reminds us of the work of God for believers that Peter has already described in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We'll read that. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in these five places, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. These Christians are the elect, which means they are chosen by God. God invades their lives. He gives them grace. These Christians have been sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit. These Christians are sprinkled by the blood of Christ, which means they've been made holy by Christ's work upon the cross. And because of that, these Christians had been obedient to the truth. This means they were obedient to the truth of the gospel. This means that they repented, they turned from their impurities, which is their sin, and they trusted in Christ. And because they were obedient to the gospel, it shows that they were truly made pure by Jesus Christ. They were truly changed by Jesus Christ. These Christians were not only obedient to the truth, but they had a sincere brotherly love for each other. Now this phrase, brotherly love, is the Greek word, and we all know this word because of the city, Philadelphia. That's the Greek word here, Philadelphia, two words, love and brother. These Christians were purified by God, they obeyed God, they had a brotherly love for each other. This is the very basic of the Christian message. People are saved, they're purified. They follow Christ, they obey Christ, and yes, they love one another. But he gives them a command in the ne next part of this verse. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Peter gives them a command. Even though they have this brotherly love, they're called to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, love is a word. This is a different word. This is agape love. It's a word that's become meaningless in our culture that brags about being loving and tolerant. Dr. Wilson comments on this tragedy that has happened in society. He says, love is a terribly debased term today, almost beyond rescue as a description of the good news of the kingdom of God in Christ. We must work to recover an understanding and practice of love. Salvation is is living in the way of love. 
The command to love one another is actually not a command that Jesus made up. It's the command that Jesus actually leans upon that is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 19 verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then Jesus, he shows us the ultimate love. The ultimate way to show love is by laying down your life for someone else. And he did that upon the cross. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. We love others not by accepting their sin, but by laying down our lives for theirs, by treating people how we would want to be treated. Let's go to our next point in verse 23. We had purified souls, and now we have powerful gospel, verse 23. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living in the abiding word of God. Furthermore, they are to love because they have been born again. Now, Peter has already talked about them being born again at the start of the letter in chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To be born again means you have passed from death to life. You were under the wrath or anger of God for your sin, but God in his grace saves you from the punishment that you deserve. Because of Christ, you now belong to the family of God, and thus you belong to God. John in his gospel mentions being born again several times. In chapter 1 and verse 3, at the start of the gospel, we see that being born again is a complete work of God through Jesus Christ by grace. John 1.12, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Or he gave the right to be born as children of God. Do you see the means of how Christians are born again? They're born again through this imperishable seed. This means the work of Christ in their lives will not perish. These Christians had a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. They experience the grace of God through the word of God that endures forever. And we see the importance of preaching the message of Jesus Christ. A person cannot experience the grace of Jesus Christ unless the message of the Bible is proclaimed to them. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the word of God is described as living and abiding. This means that the word of God changes people and continues to change people. This also means that the word of God will always remain true. You can't help but think of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. As the author of Hebrew, Hebrews reminds us of the power of the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So we had purified souls, powerful gospel. Now we have the power of the word in verses 24 and 25. For all flesh are like grass, in all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Peter now turns to the Old Testament to prove his point about the power and the enduring word of God and the faithfulness of the word of God. And Peter quotes actually Isaiah 40 verse 6 to 9, but I want to read the whole passage in the context of so we get a flavor and get a knowledge of what's going on and why Peter quotes this. So we're going to read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly, tenderly to Jerusalem and cry that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries. 
in the wilderness, prepare the way for the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill are made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry, and I say, What shall I cry? All flesh is like grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withered and the, withers in the flowered phase, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up, on up, to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, says the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. In this passage that is given to Israel, it actually happens during the time of their exile while they are in Babylon. Israel had been exiled to Babylon because they had acted in extreme rebellion against God. And in Isaiah 40 verse 2, we see that Israel has received double the punishment for their sins. But God speaks comfort to his people. The Lord is going to do something to Israel. He's going to redeem his people out of the land of Babylon. And the Lord is going to make a highway from Babylon back to the land of Israel and clear all the obstacles in the way. And the word of the Lord remains forever, which means the promises of God will not fail. And the Lord reminds the people of God of his promises that they're true. And the word of the Lord is not like humans that like are the flowers that fade and the grass that fades. The word of the Lord remains forever. And did you hear that final, pro final promise of God given to the people of Israel in verse 11? He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. And the Lord fulfilled this promise to his people. The people of God were brought back to the promised land out of Babylon. And that's where we have the books of Ezra and the books of Nehemiah. But this promise points us forward to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we see this in how Peter ends this section. He says, and this is the good news that was preached to you. Jesus accomplished this ransom or redemption, which Peter has already talked about in 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, 20, and 21. As Israel was ransomed from Egypt first and then Babylon, the Lord Jesus ransoms people from the bondage of sin. Jesus pays the price for this ransom by means of his death and his blood shed on the cross. How important would it be for these Christians to hear the enduring word of God? These Christians were suffering. These Christians were under persecution. And Peter reminds them of the power of the word of God, the faithfulness of the word of God, and the truthfulness of God's word. The word that was preached to them. So how does this passage apply to your hearts and lives? First, I want to ask the question, going back to verse 22 and 23, are you born again and have you been made holy in the sight of God? Even in this passage of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, we're reminded again of the wonderful work of Jesus that he has accomplished for us. God gives us a new birth. And God makes us holy in his sight. Colossians chapter 1 helps us understand our predicament because of our sin and our remedy because of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.21 And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Verse 22 He has now reconciled you in 
his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Because of our sin, we're alienated from God. This means we're estranged from God. Because of our sin, we're hostile or at odds with God. We've done evil in the sight of God. And this is not a good position to be in. But because of Christ, we can be made reconciled with God. We can be made holy. We can be blameless before God. Praise the Lord. Do you notice that there's three bad things there in Colossians 1.21? Alienated, hostile, doing evil deeds. But then God transforms us by his work on the cross. We're presented holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. Furthermore, look at the work of Christ in this passage. Chapter 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 23. God causes the Christian to be made holy in the sight of God. God causes the Christian to be born again. And now the Christian belongs to the family of God. If you know Christ and you belong to him, enjoy this wonderful grace that God has given you. Relish in Christ's goodness and never take it for granted. All that the Lord has done for you. The Lord's grace is amazing, so let us praise the Lord together. But if you're outside Jesus Christ, you are in the exact same position that Israel was in Isaiah 40. You are exiled from the Lord. You stand outside of his pleasing presence. So forsake your sin. Forsake the wickedness that you've committed against God and other people. And come to Christ. And find rest and grace in him. Trust Christ alone for his promises of mercy and grace. And come to Jesus just like David did after he had sinned greatly against the Lord. Come and say, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Cry out to God, cleanse me from my sin through Jesus Christ. And he continues there in, I, in Psalm 51, 2 to 3, For I know that my transgressions and my sin are ever before me. Only Christ can make us holy and give us new life by his birth. Next, love one another. We need to explain a bit about what love is. Because in our Canadian culture, people define love in order to manipulate people. Some people will say that if you do not accept certain behaviors that they want you to accept, then you're not a loving person. But when you ask them to accept people who disagree with them and love them, they want nothing to do with that definition of love. And although this passage by Paul in 1 Corinthians is read a lot, even at secular weddings, I'm not entirely sure that people fully fully understand nor accept God's definition of love in our culture. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. Love is patient and kind. Love doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. As Christians, we are called to be patient and kind with people, but we're never to rejoice at wrongdoing or sin or accept wrongdoing or sin. Of course, we just have to look at the person and work of Jesus Christ to find the pure definition of love. Jesus did all that's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And as a Christian, remind yourself again of all the patience and mercy that God has showed you through Jesus Christ. And think about how Christ's love never fails. Likewise, we need to be warned if we do not walk in love with one another, we have a serious problem. And the book of 1 John reminds us of the importance of walking with love with one another. The book of 1 John teaches us three important truths about loving with one another. First, we're commanded to love one another. This command should not be taken lightly. This command should not be disregarded because you think a certain person should be avoided and not loved. God is clear in his command. 1 John 3.22 And this is the command that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. 
just as he commanded us. Two, we're to love people because the Lord has loved us. 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. How did God love us? By sending his son Jesus to die in our place. Jesus has loved us. He went to the cross and bore the punishment of sin in our place. And number three, if we don't show love to one another, it reels we do not have love for God. 1 John 4, 20-21 If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. In this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. When we're rude, impatient, envious of people, or resentful of people, we're not acting in love. And this should cause us to wonder if we have understood God's love and the gospel. If we're more concerned with making someone feel comfortable because we don't want to hurt their feelings and thus we're rejoicing in their wrongdoing, it should cause us to wonder if we've understood God's love. So let's look to Christ see his great example of love, and let's also repent because we've not loved one another as the Bible has commanded us. And let us commit to being a people who walk in love all to the glory of Christ. And finally, do you have confidence in the word of God? The least trusted people in our society are telemarketers and politicians. When someone calls you and you can't really understand what they're saying, and they say that you have a computer virus, there's a virus on your computer, and you need to give them all their personal information to deal with it. Do you trust that person? Or when someone calls you and says that your Amazon Prime account has been hacked, and you don't have an Amazon Prime account, do you trust that person? Or when a politician makes promises that just seem too good to be true, do you think they're going to fulfill that promise? I have news for you today. The Word of God is not going to lie to you, and the Word of God is going to fulfill its promises for you. God's promises are not empty. Praise the Lord because He's given us His Word that's real, living, and active. Praise the Lord because His Word and promises are faithful. But if you believe that the Word of God is faithful, do you spend time in the Word of God getting to know this wonderful God and His promises? Do you spend time inquiring these wonderful promises of God? It's never too late to start reading the Bible once in a year. If you haven't started, make today number one. Get into the Word of God today. And here are these two verses that speak about God's faithful word, these promises to encourage you. Psalm 119, 160, the sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Yes and amen. God is faithful. His word is faithful. Thanks for watching and God bless.